Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and at this season, as we join with the rest of the nation in celebrating the United States of America, I am delighted to have back with us again an individual whom I consider to be the most engaging, brilliant scholar in the field of American Jewish history. It is a pleasure to welcome a real audience favorite back to L'Chaim, Dr. Jeffrey Gorak, the Libby M. Clapperman Professor of American Jewish History at Yeshiva University. Jeff served as Associate Editor of American Jewish History, the leading academic journal in his field, twice served as Chair of the Academic Council of the American Jewish Historical Society, and Jeff has authored or edited 15 books, including a wonderful book on Orthodox Jews in America, his classic look at the founder of Reconstructionist Judaism, Mordechai M. Kaplan, in his book, A Modern Heretic and a Traditional Community, which won him the Solvainer Prize for the American Jewish Historical Society, best book written in that field, and his book, Jews in Gotham, New York, Jews in a Changing City, 1920-2010, to 2010, won the Everett Family Foundation Award, for the best nonfiction Jewish book of 2012 from the Jewish Book Council. And he's appeared in documentary films. He's also a fabulous speaker whom I hope you get a chance to hear when he's a scholar in residence or a featured speaker in a synagogue or Jewish institution in your community. And Jeff, thank you so much for joining me again. It is always a pleasure to have you here. Well, thank you very much. It's very nice after 40 years to be an overnight <laughs> sensation with my latest book, but it's always a pleasure uh, to talk about American Jewish history to the Shalom TV family and community and uh, uh, look forward to our discussion about uh, American Jewish history this afternoon. Good. By the way, the most recent book you did as we're taping, right. which won, again, the award was? The... Uh, the Jewish Book of the Year Award from the Jewish Book Council. Yes, yeah. very, imp very, very exciting, very impressive. Very exciting. Um, it's part of a set. Yes. Yes. Okay. And I, in a sense, I share the award with uh, a group of other scholars. There are three volumes to this uh, set, uh, starting with the arrival of the first 23 Jews or more uh, in 1654, up to the uh, Bloomberg administration, where I end my, my book. So, in a sense, I share this award with Howard Rock with Annie Pollan, with Dan Sawyer, and Deborah Dashmore was the overall general editor who did a great job of keeping us together. And you know, it, it really was a, a wonderful experience working with these scholars. Uh, in many respects, our meetings were contentious, but because we have different visions of what the books should look like, but in the end, I think we put together a, a series of volumes which, uh, as a group, we hope will be the standard works on New York Jewish history. Imagine the largest Jewish city, diaspora city in the world, uh, up until now, has not had a comprehensive treatment. There's so many amazing, books right? written about New York yes. Jews, but no one put it all together but our team of four or five scholars. And Diana Linden did an accompanying visual essay for each one of the volumes. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a handsome book, the handsome books, and. Um, we're very proud that we uh, got this uh, this award. Well, we were lucky to have you do it, and you know, even as you talk, I could digress. I'm not going to only because I really want to talk about the sweep of Jewish history in America on this, in this setting. But one time, I would love to hear more about how the book, how the series, the set, came to be. And when you talk about the fact that there were, you, know, you sat with some extraordinary scholars as well as yourself and you disagreed, it would be interesting to know how, but I don't want to go there now. Yeah, that could occupy the entire, <laughs> yes, exactly. the entire show, right. but it, it, it was, okay. again, uh, it was always uh, business, not personal. Yes. Different visions yes. of how do you spend the, the amount of words you have and what do you emphasize. I'll just tell you one quick vignette. Who's more important in 1980s uh, New York Jewish history, Woody Allen or the Lubavitcher Rebbe? Well, the answer is it all depends on how you structure your narrative. And uh, that was just. I am not going to let you suck me in. Okay, fine. Because I would love to go there. I, on a different, at a different day, you'll sit at the same table. That is a question that I would love to do. 
but we're not doing it now. Okay. Okay. So um, Jews in America, just give me some of the broad sweep at the beginning. When do the, are there any Jews at Plymouth Rock? No. Okay. So when, are, when did the Jews first set foot on what we call American soil? You know, it's nice to say things like, we used to think such was the case, but now we think differently. So the iconic image we have is the arrival of 23 uh, Jewish refugees from Brazil, from Recife, who arrive in New Amsterdam in 1654, in the fall of 1654. And the accepted narrative was that Peter Stuyvesant, who was the governor of the colony, does not want these Jews in. Uh, these Jews are not forced to leave. There's the petition uh, the Dutch West Indies colony that owned uh, the, the Dutch West Indies company that owned the colony, and Jews are allowed to stay in the colony. So there are 23 Jews. We don't know their names. Uh, they're referred to as Jews who are big and small, which could mean older and younger, could be richer or poorer. We really don't know. But we also know today that when they arrived, there were already two Jews, two or three Jews already there who had come with passports from the Dutch West Indies Company. So they, those three Jews, uh, the two most important are Asher Levy and his wife Miriam, uh, who stay in the colony, uh, are the first Jews, and they get permission to stay, and they begin the process of emancipation without the, the debate over these 23, Jew, uh, 23 Jews. Now, Peter Stuyvesant gets his wish almost. He, boy, the reputation he has is that he's anti-Semitic. To what extent is that true as far as you know? Well, he is anti-Semitic, but the, I think the important thing about, uh, uh, anti, about his anti-Semitism is that in documents that we have from that period, he says, if we let in Jews, we'll also have to let in Lutherans and Papists, Catholics. He's also not happy with Quakers. He wants to create a homogeneous colony, maintain a homogeneous colony. And I would say, building upon that, if you look at the first 150 years of American Jewish history in terms of anti-Semitism, you have Stuyvesant saying, I don't want Papists in the country, and I don't want Jews in the country. Uh, our Catholic fellow citizens have far more difficulty in terms of gaining acceptance in the United States than Jews do, mm -hmm. okay? Now this is, it's somewhat of a funny statement, but it has a lot of truth that you know, Jews and anti-Semites often have one thing in common. They both see Jews as in the center of all activity, mm -hmm. okay? So in the early American experience, uh, Jews are incidental in many respects to the story. We, when we're allowed to settle, we acculturate rapidly, we are few in number, and we are not highly problematic for the Protestant majority. Mm -hmm. Catholics, on the other hand, okay, how many Catholic presidents have we had? We've had one, one non-Protestant uh, president. Catholics, on the other hand, the fear of papacy, the fear of the Pope, loom large in American minds, the Know Nothing Party in the 1840s, the 1850s, and of course when um, in 19, 1928, when Al Smith runs for president, there's anti-Catholicism. And of course, Kennedy in 1960 has that very famous speech to the Protestant ministers, I believe in Houston, Texas, and saying the Pope's not coming to America. Mm -hmm. So is Peter Stuyvesant anti-Jewish? Yes. But it's, it's, Jew bigger than anti -Jewish. it's Jews and other folks. Mm -hmm. And frankly, in terms of discrimination and racism and hatred towards minority groups in America, the Jewish saga, the Catholic saga, the Lutheran saga, does not in any way approximate the treatment of African Americans and Native Americans. Of course. Okay, so is there anti-Semitism? Yes, but I think it's incidental to the early story of Amer American Jews. So the bottom line is, if Jews are allowed to settle at all in a colony over the course of time, they accrue rights and privileges that in the European context, they often had to fight for, so the big tripwire for American Jews prior to the American Revolution is, are you allowed to settle at all? So we start with those two or three Jews, right? The Levy family, who stay with their passports, and they're on the- In New Amsterdam? In New Amsterdam, along with these 23 other people. And as I started to say, by 1664, when the British sail up the Hudson and take over New Amsterdam, everybody's gone. Everyone's gone 
with the exception of Miriam and Asher Levy. And the reason they stay, we really don't know why they stay, but perhaps they stay because he has a lucrative profession. He's a butcher, okay? These other people leave not because of anti-Semitism and not because they are concerned about leading a Jewish life. They can't make a living. And New Amsterdam is a very poor colony. It doesn't have rice. It doesn't have cotton. It doesn't have all those types of things. And it's dominated by a number of elite families. So those, those 23 Jews, almost all of them disappear. They disappear. They, well, they disappear. We don't know where they go. Well, we do know. They, we do know. Most of them, go, most of them. The, the, the venues would be either going back to Holland or perhaps going to St. Martin or Martinique. But or they leave America. They leave, they leave the okay. colony. Right. Then when is the next significant influx of Jews to America? Well, look, at the time of the American Revolution, we used to say that there were 2,500 um, Jews in the United States. We now believe that the number is approximately 1,000. Only 1,000? Only 1,000, okay? What, what, what accounts for the number being lowered? Uh, because we, uh, people who were seen as being Jewish perhaps weren't. There's more sophisticated analysis of these genealogies, but we're talking about a thousand Jews, and again, um, they're incidental to the uh, to the American story uh, in terms of the freedom that okay. Americans. They play virtually no role. They play a small role as a as a small minority within the American population. And again, this is in the. This is the end of the 18th century. This is as America is coming into being. Correct. Now, as, as late as the 1820s, 1830s, the numbers of Jews in the United States, uh, maybe 5,000, maybe 10,000. You can call me a liar by 100%. We're we'll talking about 10,000. The first significant influx of Jews to this country, where Jews become much more noticeable and is concomitant anti-Semitism eventually will be in the period between 1830 and the 1880s where primarily Central European Jews mm -hmm. come because of the difficulties gaining emancipation within what becomes Germany. Now, this is very important. We used to refer to them as German Jews. There are no German Jews because there's no Germany till the late 1860s. We're talking about people who come from Central Europe or or East European Jews who are leaving the Tsarist Empire early, coming to a place, Polish Jews, for example, come to Prussia, and then they come to America, and they're carrying Prussian passports. But they're not German Jews. They're not Prussian Jews. They're Prussian, Polish Jews. Right. So um, there's a very large Reformed congregation in St. Louis which began as an Orthodox congregation, like most Reformed congregations in America began as Orthodox. We have their constitution, and they say from here on in, our Jews are going to pray according to Minhag Polin, the Polish ritual, mm -hmm. which indicates that's their ethnicity. Well, they don't pray the Minhag Polin forever because eventually they become a liberal congregation, they become a reformed congregation. But that, so that's the period of what's sometimes called German migration, but in fact... It was a misnomer, was it? It's a misnomer. We, we now, the way we teach it now, okay, and colleagues of mine who have done very important work on periodization, we now talk about a hundred years of migration from, eight, let's say, 1825, although that year has no great particular significance, to 1924, when the gates of America are effectively closed to East European migration to this country, those, those onerous immigration laws, which um, privilege Germans and Irish at the expense of Italians, Greeks, and Jews. And notice again, these laws are not against Jews alone. Mm -hmm. We share these types of problems with other immigrant groups. So that uh, East European Jews are coming to America in significant numbers before the pogroms of 1881. And while we're on the subject of pogroms, pogroms should not be confused with Nazi Einsatzgruppen operations. They are random, they're indiscriminate, they are poorly organized, and in fact, we know that more Jews leave Lithuania, where there are relatively few pogroms, than Ukraine, where there are more pogroms. They leave 
for many of the same reasons that bring other people to this country, and that's economic opportunity. But now you're talking about the 19th century already. Late 19th century into the okay. into World War One. So let's go back a little bit. Right. Okay. I want to go back to the Revolutionary Period. By the way, everybody talks about the Turo Synagogue in Newport, Rhode Island, mm -hmm. as the oldest synagogue. Place that for us. At what point does the Turo Synagogue in Newport, Rhode Island, become a significant factor in Jewish life? And from 1654, from the middle of the 17th century, to the American Revolution, right? Obviously, there are some Jews who come here. You say by the, we have about a thousand by right. 1776, and the only thing that we know a lot about is either the Spanish Portuguese synagogue in New York, Sheriff Israel, on right off. Central Park West. Mill or, Street, or which the is South William Street today, right? in the Wall Street section of, the, of town. Or the Toro Synagogue. Well, there's also Mikveh Israel in Philadelphia. But let's go back okay, a step. So place those for okay, us. So first of all, at the time of the American Revolution, maybe there are five or six synagogues in the entire country. Okay, Because Jews are, are situated primarily in New York, Pennsylvania, uh, the Carolinas, South Carolina. Bet Elohim, which becomes the first Reformed congregation in the 19th century. This is in Charleston. Charleston, South Carolina, yep. right? Um, uh, congregation in, uh, in Georgia. Uh, and so those, those are your five, five synagogues. In fact, there are really no synagogues, no permanent synagogues in, the, in America until around 1700. Now, Sheriff Israel, the Spanish Portuguese synagogue, in New York. And they, you know, they date themselves from 1654. That's very questionable. Mm -hmm. uh, the first evidence we have of a synagogue is from a map of New York that's drawn by a Christian minister, a chaplain Miller, in 1693. Mikveh Israel of Philadelphia becomes very important Jewishly during the American Revolution when um, patriotic Jews like Chaim Salman and others flee New York when the British take over New York and they, they fructify the, uh, the growth of Mikveh Israel. The Turo Synagogue in Newport, Newport in the 18th and 19th century goes in and out of existence a number of different times because of the migration of Jews into and out of that area. So another thing we talk about now is not so much the building of synagogues, but of the demo demographic fluidity of colonialists and Jews. People, Jews are part of, of America, are part of a larger uh, New World community. Perhaps the strongest relationship that Sharit Israel, Spanish, Portuguese, and Mikveh Israel has, apart from London and Holland, would be with the Caribbean. So it, it's a more complicated, the more we look at these things, mm -hmm. uh, it's a more complicated story. Now, I, I, I've been in this business now 35 years, right? So I sometimes tell my students, I always tell my students the first time we meet, that I wish I had a copy of my original syllabus when I started teaching at Yeshiva University and compare it with what I'm teaching today. And there were very few books that we used back then that we still use today because we look at things so differently because of, I'm going to say, younger scholars uh, who do all sorts of uh, groundbreaking work which challenge what we used to believe. One of the nice things about teaching American Jewish history is the fact that we are a very dynamic field and a lot of things that we considered gospel uh, have been challenged. Give me and, one example. Well, the best example is the idea that Germans come first and then East Europeans come second, and the German-East European relationship, that the, the complexity, the patrons and those who come later. So we teach it differently now. Okay, but what about early American Jewish history around the revolutionary period? Is there any surprise? Did that also evolve for you, or would you say that as you teach your students now, mm -hmm about the five synagogues that you just right. mentioned okay. and American influence or non-influence in the Revolutionary War, right. has that changed? Okay, so I'll stick to my guns that uh, American Jews are not explicitly whispering into the framers of the Constitution and Declaration of Independence, etc. Okay, hold on, because I, I just want to make sure you, get, you work this in. Right. One of the things that I wanted you to talk about mm -hmm. was 
to what extent is either the Declaration of Independence or the American Constitution or the Bill of Rights, which come very soon after, mm -hmm. to what extent are they in fact influenced by either Jewish values, Jewish sources, Jewish individuals? Because very often the Jewish community likes to take some credit mm -hmm. for some of the things in the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, and even the Declaration of Independence. I want to know whether that's Jewish romanticism from your perspective mm -hmm. or whether it's historically accurate. Well, I'll take a sort of middle position and say that to the extent that uh, historical Jewish values or Jewish traditions uh, inform these iconic documents of American freedom, they are mediated not directly through Jewish sources but through the Protestant framers of the framers of the Constitution, okay? But one of the things about these documents, although Jews are not at the, the Continental Congress and those types no of Jews. Jews are not, uh, are not among the framers, Jews are watching what's going on, particularly in Philadelphia, and saying that, you know what, um, the rights that we have not fully achieved, it's our turn too, and in many respects, we self-emancipate ourselves, even though if you look at the great documents of American freedom, and this is a unique American Jewish experience, Jewish experience, Jews are never mentioned. And of course, the, in fact, the only group that's, the only ethnic or racial group that's mentioned in any of these documents are African Americans, who are defined as three-fifths of uh, Americans, of, of a white person. And in essence, is that good for the Jews if they're not mentioned? It's, it's great for Jews, and one of the problematics of American Jewish history. If you're going to ask me about, you know, what is the overall story of American Jews, I would say is how do you live Jewishly under a condition of, uh, of freedom? Uh, one other source, not from American Jewish history, but it's relevant. In the early 1880s, the first great Zionist thinker, Leo Pinsker, said that there are three groups in the world who have to be emancipated. Blacks, he called Negroes, Jews, and women, okay? And he also said that by virtue of the fact that they have to be emancipated, that they're never going to reach the level, if I bring you up to my level, I've been brought up to your level. So therefore, we must ought to emancipate ourselves and become Zionists. But when he's referring to Jews, he's not referring to the Jews of America. Correct. Jews of America um, mm -hmm. Our great teacher and mentor, the greatest Jewish historian of the 20th century, Sailor Barone, mm -hmm. once said many times that um, uh, Jews gain their rights uh, primarily through inadvertence, okay? And the challenge of American Jewish life. What do you life, mean by that? Well, most of the rights that you had to fight for in the European context simply happen. And when a blanket statement is made about freedom for certain groups, Jews fit in because we're incidental to the story. We benefit from that sort of act. In fact, when you have legislation that says that particular groups that dissent from the, uh, the majority Christian group, something bad might happen to them, obviously Jews fall into that category. Because when we last look, we're not part of any sort of Christian group, but it's not designed against Jews. It's designed against atheists, uh, Turks, Lutherans, Papists, I'm not just sure how many Turks there are, but they're often mentioned in the literature, right? Uh, Jews fall under that category, but Jews are not that important um, as what I might call an obnoxious group to the majority population. Okay, I want to make sure we understand here. No Jews whispering into Benjamin Franklin's ear or Thomas Jefferson's ear or Madison's ear or Washington's ear. They simply are not part of the process. Well, the only whispering is, is a loud shout out to, to, to President uh, Washington. That's, that's post. Yes, that's, we'll get to that. Oh, we'll get to that. Okay. But as but, these documents are right. being created, there is not a Jewish presence, even ancillary, to, again, the Franklins and the Jeffersons and the Madisons, et cetera. Well, we now think that Jews are talking to these framers about their own issues, about their own Jewish issues, about their own rights, but it isn't as if uh, there are rabbis for, there's no, there are no rabbis in this country until 1840. Really? Yeah. 
which means, of course, that if you attend services, you get out <laughs> earlier. Uh, but the big issue, the big issue was, are Jews at all attending services uh, during, during this time? I'd like to ask you, by the way, yeah. were they what we would now call Orthodox Jews? Well, I always say, if and until the 1820s, and, uh, if and when, and this is very important, if and when a Jew went to a synagogue, he, went, he or she, and increasingly there are she's going to those synagogues. So they're going to make an adjustment in, in, the, in the mechitza, the separation of men and women, so the women can see the action that's going on. If and when they went to a synagogue, they'd go to a synagogue which today we'd call an orthodox synagogue. Okay? So I sometimes tell my students as a bit of a joke that orthodoxy in America doesn't exist until the 19th century. And they get angry. I say, I don't mean that. I mean that terminology. Yes is often used by people who denigrate the traditional Jews, your Orthodox, your parochial, your, um, and then that takes on its own coloration as a point of pride by traditional Jews. But all those five synagogues are Orthodox synagogues in terms of prayer book, time of prayer, separation of gender during the prayers, anything you can think of as an Orthodox synagogue obtains there. But the point I made a few moments ago is that we know that by the beginning of the 18th century, in New York, and I think to some extent in Philadelphia, but certainly in New York, there are women who are clamoring for the mechitza, for the balcony, to be opened up so they can see what's going on. In other words, remove the lattice work so they have a better, a better sense of what's going on. The petitioning for this change is not articulated by the women because they're not members of the congregation. They, uh, a woman enters synagogue life through her father, remains through her husband, and it's gender discriminatory. But the other piece is, so the congregation opens up the, yeah, opens up the mechitza. Should understand, a mechitza is some form of division that separates men and women within a traditional synagogue. Right. Very often the women were, quote, upstairs. They were in the balcony, And right. very often there was lattice work that made it impossible or difficult for men to turn around and see them, but it also made it difficult for women to look out and see what was happening down below. Correct. And so you're saying there, were, there was a clamoring from the women, although they could not petition themselves. Correct for that lattice work to be taken away so they had a better view of what was happening in the men's section below. Correct. Okay. Correct. And eventually, eventually it's done. Now, why does the congregational leadership accede to it? Well, there are several things in play, but one of them is sort of interesting. Uh, they become aware from the newspapers of the time, and there are no Jewish newspapers, the general newspapers of the time, that there's some criticism of the fact that these pretty ladies are up there as if they're, and I'm making the, not, not my words, as if they're in a chicken coop. And in terms of how people were treated, the people on the balcony in churches, okay, was usually reserved to, to, for two underprivileged groups, one or three indentured servants, Negroes, African Americans, and this amorphous group called students, okay. So they're being critical of the Jews. How are you treating your ladies, your women, mm -hmm. in the balcony? The other thing we know that's sort of interesting is that Jewish women are going to services more than they did in the European context, having something to do with the fact that Christian women are going to mm -hmm. services. It's very important to see what Christians are doing, and we're emulating them sociologically, although not religiously. And we also know that, like men might jostle for the right seat, women are also jostling for the right seats and there's pushing and shoving going on, which is um, often took place among men down, uh, downstairs, taking place upstairs as well. And final this point, again is the 18th century. This eight, fi yes. Final point, having talked so much about synagogues in this, in this segment, the truth of the matter is, you've asked me what I've moved away from. My teaching in the colonial early national period used to be very synagogue-centric. Now I'm talking about the varieties of experiences, the fluidity of Even what's, outside the synagogue? Uh, outside the synagogue. You know, traditionally, uh, 
uh, when you build the Jewish community, the first institution you build is a cemetery, not a synagogue. What do you do about circumcisions? We know that circum who performs a circumcision. We know that boys are circumcised not only on the eighth day if the child is healthy, but weeks, months, and some cases years because the moil, the person who performs a circumcision, can't get out to these remote, remote places. So what is the synagogue life for that person in a remote area? Oh, fascinating. Okay, and what's the life of, of Jewish women? Uh, listen, I don't want to blow my own horn. Uh, one of my colleagues at Brown University, Holly Snyder, who's written on this subject, has opened our eyes to the multiplicity of behaviors mm -hmm. religiously that are within and, most importantly, without synagogue, without synagogue life. So are the five synagogues important? Yes. But there's a other narrative that has to be told about uh, how Jews live their lives in a frontier environment. Okay. And by the way, in some way, it has been true of Jewish life forever. There is always an element of the community that is very involved in synagogue life, mm -hmm. and there's always an element, sometimes even more in number, greater in number than those in the synagogue. The Jewish community has also done extraordinary things outside the synagogue, and it's interesting to hear this was true even in 17th, 18th century Judaism in America. But I'll, but I'll jump to the 20th century, okay? In a book called Jews in Gotham, okay, yes. <laughs> I point out that if you lived in on the Grand Concourse in the 20s, in the there, Bronx, in the Bronx, right? You know, a few, uh, a few home runs away from Yankee Stadium, okay? Um, and you live in that predominantly Jewish neighborhood. You could believe your whole world was Jewish without ever setting foot in the synagogue. And I have this image, and we have photographs of this, we have memoirs of this, of people promenading up and down the Grand Concourse on your Mimnoraim, the High Holy Days, some of them going into the synagogue for a while, some of them not. But the sense was everyone was Jewish. You work with Jews, you live with Jews. If you were lucky enough to go to college, you went to City College, which was 85% Jews, and you thought the entire world was Jewish, even though I know from the statistics that 30% of the population is Christian. Mm -hmm. So you have this type of informal Jewish nexus that is very, very uh, important and becomes problematic, by the way, in our own contemporary era when Jews move from these neighborhood enclaves to more suburban environments where they are interacting with, uh, with Christians. Okay, I'm coming back to 1776 sure. again. Okay. Um, I want to talk about whether when Paul Revere makes this ride, whether he's calling to anybody who's Jewish to also fight the British, and whether Chaim Solomon, who, mm -hmm. when you go to a Talmud Torah, one of the heroes of the revolutionary period for the Jewish world, Jewish community, is Chaim Solomon. So I want you to talk about who Chaim Solomon was, okay. to what extent is, again, that over-romanticized, or, do, or does he occupy in your mind a very important part, role, in American Jewish history, and again, when America went to war against the British, were Jews involved? Okay, so several things have to be said. First, about Paul Revere's ride. There were almost no Jews in Massachusetts at the time of the American Revolution, although there was an apostate Jew uh, named Judah Monis who taught Hebrew at Harvard and wrote the first... Uh, Hebrew grammar books in, uh, in America. An apostate, he, though. He, he left Judaism. Yes, in order to teach at Harvard. <laughs> people do all sorts of things that get tenure, but this is pretty outside the, uh, the realm. Uh, and he wrote three memoirs, uh, one called The Truth, some called The Whole Truth, Nothing But The Truth, uh, in which he explained why he converted. And uh, I, I had the privilege four or five years ago to teach at Harvard um, a course in American Jewish history, and I thought it would take a sentimental pilgrimage to find Judah Monus's grave, and I couldn't. It was all, it was, you know, the years and weather had destroyed his tombstone. Anyway, so as far as the American Revolution is concerned, okay, generally speaking, most of, we used to think that all Jews were patriotic and no Jews supported the British side. Uh, we now understand that like most Americans, Jews, those thousand Jews, are predominantly pro-revolution. 
Um, but like other Americans, there are loyalists and there are people who, like in all wars who are bystanders. So as far as Chaim Solomon is concerned, first of all, he's a patriotic American Jew. Where does he live? First in New York, then Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. He's a leader of the uh, Philadelphia Jewish community. Uh, he does lend money to the uh, patriotic cause. He is reimbursed for his, uh, his contribution. Uh, Fifty or sixty years later, his family um, uh, petitioned Congress for monies that he didn't get. Uh, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, and you're right, he becomes an iconic figure. Um, actually, the, um, uh, the present chair of the Academic Council, Beth Wenger, who teaches at the University of Pennsylvania, did a wonderful book called History Lessons and talks about how Chaim Solomon was elevated to this position of being the great Jewish patriot. But one of our uh, older colleagues once said that, you know, it's in some, re some respects it's sad that America lionizes Nathan Hale, who gave his life for the country, and we elevate a moneylender, you know, which feeds into a particular stereotype. So, is Chaim Salman important? Yes, okay. Did he save the American Revolution? Did George Washington send an envoy to the synagogue in Mikveh Israel and interrupted services and he raised a lot of this stuff is part of the desire of American Jews going back in time to put us front and center in this American saga. It was important. You know what? It tells us more about us as American Jews than it does about Chaim Solomon. Patriotic, good Jew, traditional Jew, support of the revolution, but I don't think the revolution hinged on his particular, uh, particular activity. I know that's not the case. Okay. You know, when you hear the concept that human beings are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, uh, it has a ring to it as if it is something that comes out of the first couple of chapters of the book of Genesis. The but there's, the, there's another side to it, okay? And that is perhaps the, the greatest defense of the institution of slavery takes place not down south and not through the lips of a Protestant minister, but through the lips of, in 1861, of Rabbi Morris Rafal, who's the rabbi of B'nai Jeshurun, which today is a conservative congregation in New York. In New York City, it's in New York, who uses biblical texts to justify the institution of slavery and to justify the perception of African Americans as inferior to whites, and therefore they should serve their, their white masters. It is a sermon which um, is, uh, used, is used by Southerners to justify the institution of slavery. And again, it's articulated by a rabbi, but it could have just as well been articulated by a, a Protestant minister supporter of the South, and it takes place in New York City which when I first, last looked is up north, mm -hmm. so that, you know, the Torah speaks, uh, Torah teachings uh, are appropriated in a variety of different ways. And, you know, again, I don't uh, purport to be a, an expert on the framers of the Constitution, but we all know the same people who talked about inalienable rights are denying it to African Americans. So it's a very braided history, both in terms of America uh, and, Amer and American Jews. Okay. And now what about the famous letter that George Washington first receives and then responds to Gershon Satius in Providence, in the no, Newport, Newport, Rhode Island? The Newport Jewish community. Right. Okay. So, I mean, that again seems to be an iconic moment in American Jewish history. I want you to tell me how factual it is and whether, again, we're romanticizing it all. This one need not be romanticized. This is one of the most significant documents, not only in American Jewish history, but in, in modern Jewish history. For the follow First of all, the quick story. Um, as the, new pre the president of the new country, Washington goes on what we might call today a victory tour. Okay? You know the old concept, George Washington slept here? Well, he slept everywhere. Okay? Uh, but he visits a variety of communities. He's trying to promote unity of Americans. 
and the Jews of Newport get wind of the fact that he's coming their way. So he, they send a letter to Washington congratulating him on becoming president of the United States, not becoming king, but becoming president, although they don't mention kingship. And they, they talk about their vision of America, that America, I don't have the document in front of me, but in terms of deny, uh, opposing prejudice, freedom for all people, uh, et cetera. And Washington cribs it and writes back to them and says, well, America stands for these types of things. And most importantly, for the first time in Jewish history, Jews are referred to as citizens of the United States by the first president of the United States. So I said a few moments ago that Jews aren't formally emancipated. But this term of citizenship, it predates the citizenship that's granted in 1789 and then in 1791 in France and then in Holland and again, citizenship that is eventually extended to Jews in Central Europe, and citizenship that's never extended to Jews in Eastern Europe until they get quasi-citizenship during the Russian Revolution, with all its negatives that come along with it. This is a very significant, and I would say, you can't make enough of a statement about how important that type of document was in terms of seeing where we are in American Jewish life and Mark. All of this takes place before 99.9% .9 of American Jews e come to, to America, okay? Uh, I wonder if there's any one of your viewers or any of the people involved with Shalom TV who are Jews who can date themselves back to that. But the traditions that were established, sometimes inadvertently, but this time frontally, have served us very well in terms of America being a land of freedom for Jews, uh, which only raises the question that I mentioned a moment ago, is that given this freedom, how do you live, uh, how do you live appropriately, and uh, how do you maintain your Jewish traditions in a, in a country, in a world that's accepting of Jews? And that's the problematic of American Jewish history, not freedom, but the challenges of freedom in terms of our own identity. You know, and one of the things that Shalom TV does is to talk to the issues of Jewish identity and providing a modern uh, venue for Jews to learn and to think and to address these questions of how to remain Jewish in, uh, in the 21st century. And, mm -hmm. that's, that, and that's one of the reasons I come on this show. That's very sweet of you. It's not only sweet, it's true, okay? <laughs> yes. And uh, this is really very true that in contemporary times, we have to use the most modern media available to us to teach this message of survival mm -hmm. for Jews in the, a 21st century environment. We could go, you know, decade by decade, 50 years by 50 years. It was appropriate given the event that we are celebrating here, the birth of the United States, to talk about the period that really surrounds the latter part of the 18th century, the 1776s, and then the, the letter which came a few years later to that after George Washington becomes the first president. But I want you to give me a general perspective at the moment. If someone were to say to you, as a student of American Jewish history, what's been the arc of anti-Semitism that Jews have had to deal with? You described how at one point, if you wanted to become a professor at Harvard, you couldn't be Jewish. I know that even when I was early, very young, there were people who wanted to go to Harvard. There was a quota. Yale had a quota. We know that Alan Dershowitz graduates Harvard, has all kinds of issues and problems. It now seems to be different. But I also remember talking to people who grew up in Texas as young Jews and had to literally fight their way to school. So to what extent has there been from 1776 to today, how would you sort of um, summarize the extent to which anti-Semitism has either ebbed, flowed, grown, dissipated, What's Jeff Gorak's analysis? Well, it's, uh, there's a very long answer, but I'll just give you a few pieces. If you permit me to work backwards, I want to tell you that at 2013, we are living in a, through a period, hopefully it will continue, 
of unparalleled acceptance for Jews. No place outside of uh, Medinat Yisrael, the state of Israel, are Jews as free. We've never been as free as we are today. If you can factor out anti-Israel anti-Semitism and, uh, anti, uh, and revisionist anti-Semitism and some skinheads in Montana, okay, the fact is that we live in an era of, of unconditional acceptance of Jews in the United States. Never before has it been quite as good. Okay? It, it got better after World War II, slowly but surely. Okay? Going back in time, going back in time, I am so interested in the interwar period. Uh, social anti-Semitism is extraordinarily, extraordinarily high. Uh, if you, you talked about quotas at Harvard, Yale, Princeton, etc. Uh, my generation, I'm in my 60s, is in an era where these doors began to open up. But going back to my parents' generation, if you were a Jewish boy or girl, young man, young woman, you aspire to go to these elite universities, uh, it's very, very difficult to, get, to gain acceptance. And if you're a New Yorker and you're a young man, the place you go to is City College, which was 85% uh, Jewish. Now, ironically, south of the Mason-Dixon line, are places like University of Alabama, Louisiana State University, there are no quotas against Jews. There are, it's African Americans are barred, but Jews have it easier down there, except when some New York Jews go there, and the indigenous Jewish community is not so happy with these loud, perhaps leftist Jews showing up in the, uh, in the country. So. The biggest problem Jews have faced historically in terms of anti-Semitism is fortunately not violent anti-Semitism, but occupational and social anti-Semitism. If my grandfather wanted to be a physician, good luck, uh, very difficult getting into medical school. He could become a lawyer, but you can't be part of a white shoe law firm, okay? Uh, uh, that was off limits to Jews. But increasingly, as we move towards a contemporary period, um, Jews are accepted. I want you to do something I've heard you do before. It's sort of a wrap-up, you know, as, a, as we celebrate America. You have a way of illustrating the arc of the modern contemporary Jewish experience as it relates to baseball. Mm -hmm. you know, give me the summary there of the arc of Jewish life as reflected in the way the Jewish community has been treated by Major League Baseball. Okay, well, uh, you know, one of my books deals with Judaism in sports, yes. not Jews in sports. So uh, I look at three uh, or four different events that surround the fact that almost every year there is the coincidence of I, our High Holy Days with the World Series or the playoffs, whatever it may be. Today, the playoffs extend through Simchas Torah, and <laughs> they keep going this way, it'll go into Hanukkah. Okay, but be that as it may. So in the 1930s, the greatest Jewish ball player of his era, to my mind, his greatest claim to fame is that he played handball with my mother in the Bronx, okay, is Hank Greenberg. And Detroit's in the pennant race against the evil empire, although they weren't called that then, the Yankees, and Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are approaching. There's tremendous pressure placed on Greenberg to play on the Jewish High Holy Days. In the end, he plays on Rosh Hashanah, but he doesn't play on Yom Kippur. And he, although not an observant Jew, he goes into a synagogue in Detroit, I think it's Shari Tzedek Synagogue, and receives a standing ovation. But the point I want to make about it is if you want to know how Jews are uh, being treated, he's told by his uh, manager and the owner Mickey Cochran is the manager, I believe it says, you have, a, you have a communal responsibility to play on these days. And wars and sports, I was taught a long time ago, are community-defining situations. You know, every year we uh, memorialize correctly number 42, uh, Jackie Robinson. It's a community-defining situation when Robinson's allowed to play Major League Baseball. Okay? So that's, that's the, if you want to know how Detroit Jews are being treated in the 1930s, look at Hank Greenberg. He's pressured to play. This is a town that's renowned or notorious for being home to Henry Ford, the Ku Klux Klan, Father Coughlin, 
I may have left out somebody else who was nefarious in terms of treatment of Jews. So now we fast for forward to 1965 and Koufax, you know the story, or the not an observant Jew, he decides I'm not going to play on Yom Kippur in America, a more cultural pluralistic America says you don't have to play on your Jewish holiday. You know, I'm laughing because my favorite story is that he, do he doesn't pitch and his roommate Don Drysdale pitches, and I've told the story hundreds of times all over the country. And Drysdale, who's a Protestant, pitches, and he pitches terribly. And when he's taken out of the game by Walt Alston, he says to Walt, today I bet you wish I was also a Jew, because if I was a Jew, I wouldn't be playing. So then you fast forward to 1986. By the way, he was not pressured to play. No, on the contrary. In any way. That's right. So this tells you, thank you, that tells you where Jews are at in 1965. We're doing better. In 1986, the Mets are in the playoffs. And again, Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur, I think Yom Kippur is concomitant with the, one of the crucial games. And Jews of New York have the chutzpah or self-assurance of belonging in America to say to Major League Baseball, um, cancel the game, postpone the game. And uh, George Vesey of the New York Times writes an op-ed piece in which he tells the fans of New York, do not worry, Jewish fans. God will intercede. He predicts there'll be great thunderstorms and the game will be canceled. And he advised fans to start building arcs like the biblical Noah. End of the day, the game does split place, but it does say a lot about where we are as Jews in America. And then two years ago, I take credit in quotation marks for what happened around Yom, uh, Erev Yom Kippur, Kol Nidre night. The Red Sox were going to play against the Yankees. And, Major League, and ESPN and Major League Baseball was going to have the game at the very time when there is Kol Nidre night. So there was a tremendous outcry from the Jews of New York and American Jews. So the public relations people at Yeshiva University, where I'm privileged to teach, said, you've got to say something, do something. So I quickly wrote out a protest, which was put on Yeshiva University's website. And a couple of, hours, a couple of minutes or hours later, the game was pushed back to 1 o'clock so that you could go to the game at 1 o'clock, get home, have your meal, and go to synagogue or temple later on. So I walked around yeshiva subsequent to that saying, hey, you know, <laughs> I did it. I didn't do it. I was sort of like the Jews in the American Revolution. I happened to be there, but incidental and not important. But it says a lot about, uh, now, why did Major League Baseball fall to this? A, because it was the right thing to do. And B, because, frankly, I think the economic power and influence of Jews in the United States, in the end, in, uh, in any event, it was the right thing to do. And I want to finish this by going to a different sport and to move away from New York. A few years ago, in Iowa, in Des Moines, Iowa, a young man who goes to one of the uh, public schools, who's a member of a reform congregation, appealed to the school board to have the Friday night football game, which was going to take place the night of Rosh Hashanah, the first day of Rosh Hashanah, canceled because he wanted to observe the holiday. And lo and behold, the Des Moines School Board agreed to postpone the game. His local rabbi, I'm chagrined I don't remember his name, a reform rabbi, you know, went to the school board with this young man, and the game was postponed. Not only that, not only was it a head, now in, in Iowa, like in Ohio or Texas and elsewhere, Friday night lights are not the sharpest candles, okay? Friday night lights is a major community defining situation. Football. Football, Friday night football. They move the game away to accommodate a request from a Jewish student, and to make the story even nicer, there was a sidebar story in the Des Moines Register explaining to the community what the Jewish holidays were all about. Look how far we've come. It's a, it's a great tribute to America, and it's a great tribute to this young man who, unfortunately, I forgot his name, who said, I want to stand up for my faith, and fortunately, he's in an America where Des Moines, Iowa, it's not Bronx, New York, it's not Brooklyn, New York, where you have an America which was accepting of his request, it's a big deal. It really is a big deal. You're fabulous. Thank I you. love talking to you all the time. Just chapter one, though. Chapter. This is just chapter one right. on Shalom TV. Jeff Kurak, Kol Tuvah Hatzlacha. Thank you. And again, you know, Shalom TV does very important work, is doing very important work to bring this sort of media exposure to Jewish 
life in a variety of different ways is a great blessing for the Jewish community. And uh, I wish you and everybody involved great success. Thank you very, very much. Which I know is coming your way. Thank you. My conversation with Dr. Jeffrey Gurak, the Libby M. Trapper, Professor of American Jewish History at Yeshiva University, uh, one of the outstanding minds and hearts on the American Jewish scene. And it is always an extraordinary pleasure for me to have him sitting in that chair. And it's a pleasure for me to be able to share him with you. As always, if there's anything Jeff said that you want to comment on, if you want to be in touch with Jeff, please be in touch with me. Email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, tweet me. I look forward to hearing from you. And for me, the experience of being born an American Jew, living in this extraordinary, and I continue to use the phrase, it's a social experiment, but it has been one of brilliance that has given opportunity to people of all color, all faith, all gender, all sexual orientation, a vision of what it means to be a free human being living in a social polity that joins all people together. And yes, there are still problems to the United States of America, but they are minuscule when put in perspective. And I know that for me and my family, my wife Ruth, my kids, my grandchildren, I feel I am the luckiest of all generations to have been born a Jew in the United States of America with a world Jewish community that is thriving and growing. And for all the challenges and for all the BDS movement, being a Jew today is being a Jew in perhaps the most brilliant, wonderful time in all of Jewish history. And I am especially proud to be able to celebrate with all of you the glory, the brilliance, the creation, and the contribution of the United States of America. I'm Mark Golub. Until the next time, L'chaim, my friends, to life. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to Jem, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support. L'chaim is a presentation of Jewish Education in Media.